I've always wanted to post something on Let's Not Meet, because I've been reading posts on this subreddit since I was little. I can't say I'm too pleased to have an experience to post now that it's actually happened. I haven't really told anybody this story, because I didn't want to freak out any of my friends, so I've limited it to just my mom and a few close friends. Well, I suppose now you'll know. So, let's begin. So how my friend group works is that we have our little circle of people who we hang around with most often, but for big events or bonfires or something similar, we expand and a couple of different friend groups join one. Ben is a part of one of these extended friend groups. He's someone who always posts different and interesting things, who always has something to say. I've gotten along really well with Ben at these events, and we always end up chatting. I've always found him to be a different and unique individual. Ben started going to my local college this year. He shot me a Snapchat basically saying, Hey, all my friends went away to different schools, and the only person I have to talk to from the area is now my ex-girlfriend. I was wondering if you wanted to get a group together maybe and hang out, because I'd like to have some new friends around. It was actually a really nice message, because with the course I'm in, I don't get to make many friends, and all my close friends are spread out now too, so I said yes. The hangout was initially supposed to be one of my friends, him, and one of his friends. It was a day after class, and I just got home. He told me he was going to take a quick nap before we all head out. When he wakes up, he tells me it's now too late and he has other plans he forgot about. That's totally fine. I wasn't really upset about it. I cancel with my friend, too, so I can just sit down and do some homework. He texts me a few hours later. I didn't give him my number. How did he find it? Telling me his other plans got canceled, and he was now available again. He wanted to know if I still wanted to do something. I said that my friend was now out of the city and he said he texted his friend, but they didn't answer. He decided to pick me up and go for a drive and just chat. Normal enough. Ben gets to my house at around 10. I go and hop into his car, and he speeds off. Oddly enough, he's talking in a weirdly accented voice, kind of like Jamaican or something similar. I thought he was just trying to be goofy, so I played along. Sometimes I would answer back in the accent, but then I started to think how it was weird that he wasn't talking in his own voice at all. He was driving like a maniac down the street, telling me how he was drinking earlier because he thought he was going to a party. I asked him if he was drinking and driving, and then he said that he'd only had a few sips. I know I probably should have gotten out of the car then, but at this point we were flying down the highway, and I was pretty scared. He begins to rant about his ex, telling me that there was infidelity and trust issues on his end, and he couldn't tell me what they were because he didn't want me to think badly of him. He told me he was still going to marry this girl and have her children. He ranted about her and got on tangents and started to scream and yell. I started to think that he was probably on some drug or something. We arrived at my college, a half hour to 40 minute drive away in another city and he says we should get out of the car. I'm already scared and my phone is dying, so I just listen to what he says. At this point, I'm literally thinking he might kill me. He took me for a walk through the light woods, and then started to make sounds like a creature. It was weird. He would make like dinosaur sounds, or sounds like from the grudge. He would also walk like a creature, morphing his body into these weird, creepy movements. I requested for us to go home right away because I was literally terrified. We get back into the car and start our drive home. He pulls out a pipe and smokes something. I told him he shouldn't do that while he was driving, but he just didn't listen. Now he begins to yell. He starts back on his tangents about life again. He pulls over the car to get out and do some jumping kicks. At this point, my phone is dead. He gets back into the car and puts on his favorite song. 
The song begins slow and then picks up a little later. It's about a four-minute song. He begins to scream along with the lyrics and smash the windows and dashboard with his hands, stomping his feet around. I've seen someone passionate about a song before, but not like this. Ben swerves all around the road, until we finally get to my house. Then he turns to me and says without an accent, I know it's late, but uh, did you want to have sex? In the most casual tone in the world. I gave a nervous laugh and said, I Actually, uh, I'm good. He turned to the back seat to get something, but I got out of my car and booked it into my house. I locked the door right away, and the bedroom door in my room, as if I thought he would break in or something. It might not sound as terrifying as it was for me in the moment, but at the time I was shaking out of pure fear. I don't know if he was just on some crazy drug or if he had a split personality or something but I've never met a person before who I've looked at and thought to myself, you are going to kill someone one day. I really hope he doesn't see this, because I actually see him at school quite frequently. So, yeah, what a fun life. So this happened a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college, and was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's house the night I arrived at my hometown. I phoned a friend of mine from high school to see if I could stay over at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town, and I'd stayed at his place before so I knew there would be a place for me if they could allow it. My friend, let's call him Z, seemed like a pretty normal dude. We weren't the best of friends or anything, but we got pretty close by the time we had graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town and catch up with each other, reminisce on the times we spent in orchestra or English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic, Z's a normally upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting ready to get a brand new car. I didn't really think about it at the time, and he said I could sleep in the guest room, so I headed right over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he had been on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do like getting high and watching weird movies, or just playing video games together. Z's parents weren't home so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely see each other, I thought a little bit of bonding time couldn't hurt. We played Smash Bros, smoked some weed, and just chatted for a few hours. It was longer than I had wanted, but I was having fun, so whatever, right? By the time it was getting late at around 2 a.m., he started asking some pretty weird questions. If I ever wondered what it was like to kill someone, or if I thought anyone would miss me when I was gone. This, along with some pretty normal questions like if I had a boyfriend, or how my parents were doing, or if I was making friends at school, they all gave me a weird feeling. I was confused in the moment but it didn't hit me until after that that Z could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all made me just want to go right to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement, where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight, and I go to my room and get ready for bed. I'm having a little trouble sleeping, just some insomnia that I've had for a while, so I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some slight movement outside my room. The walls were all pretty thin, so I could hear footsteps walking past my door and up the stairs to the main floor, then back down quickly after. What struck me as odd was that I didn't hear the basement door open. It creaks very loudly when it does. The light didn't turn on either, so I was confused what Z was doing. I heard him go back into his room, but I just had this odd feeling. Ever since I met him this night, he seemed to be a lot different than he's ever been. I decided to look him up on social media 
and Google to see if anything was out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal, until I found his Tumblr, which was linked from his inactive Twitter account that I found on my Twitter contacts list. His Tumblr was, well, disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals, links to suspicious-looking websites that I didn't dare to click on. Text posts and stories about murdering, cannibalism, necrophilia, and torture. There were also photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely were taken in his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a text post from the account saying he wished he could find someone easy to kill like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew he was going to do something. He must have gone up the stairs to lock the door. I packed my things, luckily I had packed very lightly, and opened up this small window at the top of my bedroom's wall. I started to desperately climb through. As I was pulling my legs through, he opened the door. It was dark, but the streetlight illuminated enough for me to see he was carrying something long and skinny, probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't either. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, but not before telling the police. They said they couldn't do anything, as the guns were legally registered under his dad and he hadn't actually done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with him. Ever since then, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the realization that someone I knew so well could underneath be this person who could hurt me so bad, could want to kill me. I don't know what he's doing now, and I'm not sure I want to, but I hope he's getting some help. So this happened to me last semester. I'm a college student and I've only had positive experiences, except for this encounter I had throughout the entirety of the last semester. Just a disclaimer, this will probably be long, but I tried to space out the paragraphs for it to be easier to read. I'm a psychology major, and between taking AP classes in high school and taking a few extra classes over the summer, I'm already ahead of my class. Last summer I registered for a neuroscience course, which was a bit more advanced, and all the kids in the class were either juniors or seniors about to graduate. On the first day of class I made my way to the classroom, and the professor was late. There was a big crowd of people outside, and I simply asked a boy if he was waiting for the same class. He said yes. He introduced himself to me as Braxton. And that was that. The professor came and the class was pretty good. At the end of class, he asked me for my number, just in case we had to discuss homework assignments and whatnot, and I thought it would be a cool connection to have. Boy, was I wrong. I saw him about twice a week for an hour and a half, not even two weeks after I met him, only seeing him in class. He stated that he felt a connection to me that I was the most beautiful and fascinating girl he had ever met. I ignored the connection part of it and thanked him for his compliment. That was that. The week after he mentioned this, he had texted me asking me out of nowhere if I had anxiety. I hesitantly said yes and kept it very broad. I told him that large crowds of people are my biggest trigger, but I managed just fine. He made it a point to tell me that if I ever needed to escape, he knew a few spots that were vacant and deserted. I told him I was fine and he seemed to drop it. The week after, we said our goodbyes and I started walking to my next class. Usually we say goodbye and I don't see him until class two days later. He turned around quickly and started walking next to me. I told him that I was fine and that he could go to his own class. He said, No, no, it, it's fine. I want to walk you to math. I know people scare you. I stopped dead in my tracks and asked him how he knew I had math class after our NS class. 
he told me not to worry about it. As much as I was weirded out, I decided to ignore it. Keep in mind, I never once told him my schedule, or really anything about myself. He dropped me off and I felt relief thinking that was that. I brushed it off as him just trying to be a little gentleman. An hour and a half later, he was waiting for me right outside the room and then said, Let's get you to English. I lied and told him that my English class had been cancelled, and alarms had gone off in my head. Apparently, this kid knew my whole schedule and where classes were located and what times. Although I again ignored it because I didn't want to be rude to him, I took it as him trying to be nice, so I tried to forget about it. After that incident, everything seemed to return to normal, until it wasn't. As stated earlier, I have some pretty bad anxiety, and on this day in particular, I was having a pretty off day. Class started, and I grew more and more anxious and had to step out, so I did. I went to the bathroom and calmed myself down, and returned quietly, only to notice that Braxton was not in his seat. He came back soon after and took his seat right behind me, and immediately whispered in my ear, Don't you ever leave without my permission again. Do you understand me? I just nodded and apologized so he would stop, and then he returned back to normal. One of his few obsessions with me was that something would happen to me, and that he had to protect me at all costs. If I wasn't okay, he would flip out and do anything in his power to return me to an okay state. It was odd. There were a few instances in which it got really freaky. One of these instances was the day he noticed my medical bracelet for hypoglycemia. As soon as he noticed it, he started interrogating me about why I had it, what it was, if I take medications, when was my last episode. He then proceeded to grab my hand to try and snap a picture of my parents' phone numbers on the back. I told him it wasn't his business, and if he really needed that information one day, he would have it on my wrist. He got upset but dropped it. That Friday, he had called me from his job. He worked at a hospital doing office-type work and said, Hey, I have you on speaker, and I'm with one of my colleagues. I need you to explain your condition, why it happens, and give me a list of medications you take. I told him that it was completely out of line and hung up on him. He blew up my phone telling me how important it was to get help and how important it was for him to know everything about it. I started ignoring him. The next time I saw him, he acted normal and even apologized for his actions. We moved on until the next thing. I had twisted my ankle pretty bad on campus, and I had been crying. It was pretty obvious I was in pain and stressed. As soon as he saw me, he completely flipped out, asking who did this to me, if I was okay, if I needed medications. He demanded he was going to take me to the university clinic. He told me I wasn't allowed to call my mother, and that only he could deal with this. I told him that he didn't control me, and I ended up calling my mom, obviously, where she told me to go to the clinic and that she would pick me up there. I told Braxton that we could just get an escort by the campus police. The clinic was a few blocks away, and he immediately shut that down and got extremely upset. No, we are absolutely not going to the police. I'm going to get an Uber, but we're not going to the police. Don't you even think about calling them. This was extremely alarming to me because why did he want to stay away from the police so badly? He ended up calling an Uber and we got to the clinic finally. He insisted on being right by my side the entire time and wanted me to hold his hand. He kept trying to rub my back and touch me. I told him to stop and that I didn't want him touching me and for him to just leave. He insisted on staying. There wasn't really much I could do, so I dealt with it until my mother came to get me. I was extremely tense and kept my hands to myself and just sat still. After I left, he followed up with multiple texts, asking if I was okay and if I could keep him updated. I ignored all of his messages. Towards the end of the semester, a mutual friend we had in that class messaged me, asking if Braxton had ever made me feel uncomfortable. I told her the truth, and the multiple instances that I immediately got bad vibes from him. 
Not even five minutes after I sent the message to her, Braxton starts blowing up my phone. Calling, texting, leaving voicemails. He kept threatening me, saying he was going to find me, and as soon as he did, that it was over for me. He said I had ruined his life, and that he hated me, and that I was a horrible person. He was going to show me what I deserved the next time he saw me, and that I had no idea what was coming for me. His voicemails were so full of rage. His voice was even shaking because of how angry he was, and he was yelling his heart out on one voicemail, and in the next, sobbing about why I didn't love him back, how I could betray him like this. Obviously, I didn't go to school that day, and his hundreds of voicemails and texts alternated between rage and apologies, and every emotion in between. It was terrifying. The only reason I did not block this guy or tell anyone about him was because I was terrified he would do something to me. He would remind me that if I was scared of him now, he would give me a reason to be scared later, either if I went to the police or tried distancing myself more. He found every single one of my study spots. I'm a commuter, so I would study and stay at many different coffee shops, and if I wasn't at the ones I usually stayed at, he would message me saying that he would find me if I didn't tell him where I was. He told me that if I ever went to the police that he would give me a reason not to. Things like that. He also shared with me that he would fantasize about me, and how badly he wanted me. He said he loved the way I smelled, and even wanted to take pieces of my hair to keep at home. It was awful. At the very end of the semester, I completely stopped talking to him, and he seemed to have gotten the hint. I moved seats in class, and he didn't seem to bother me after I made it evident I wanted nothing to do with him. On the last week of semester, he started to take pictures of me from across campus and send them to me with multiple numbers. He would say things like, You're gorgeous today. I love you so much. I just wish you loved me back. You'll pay for this. Your betrayal to me and humankind. On the very last day I had gotten on my commuter bus and was seated and on my way home, I got a text from him with a video of me getting onto the bus that said, See you soon, darling. I was paranoid for weeks afterwards. Luckily, nothing had ever happened since then. He never texted me again, and I hadn't seen him at all after last semester. He deleted all of his social medias. Hopefully, he moved away or graduated. Honestly, I just hope he is far, far away. The other night, I was driving in the center lane of a three-lane city street. All of a sudden, a car comes up into my right blind spot and almost slams into me. I look over and it's swerving in and out of the lane, braking abruptly. I honk and I look over to see if the driver is possibly distracted, and I see that the man is driving while drinking something out of a brown bottle. The man then comes up to my side and is screaming at the top of his lungs. Not wanting to get involved in this whole situation, I made a lane change to the leftmost lane to try and get away from the man. I could still hear him screaming, so I turn on my rear view camera, and I see the man swerve across two lanes from the rightmost to get behind me. He starts speeding up, as if he's trying to ram me from behind. Once I see him inches from my bumper, I decided to run the red light I'm stopped at and make a right turn in front of the two lanes of traffic beside me in the hopes that he'll just leave me alone. I look at my rear view camera again and I can see that the man is following me, trying to hit me from behind yet again. I panicked. I sped off on a side street, but I looked back to see he just wouldn't let up. He was swerving in the lanes behind me, trying to keep up. In the distance, I saw a freeway on-ramp, so I decided to speed over in hopes of losing him on the freeway. The on-ramp has two lanes that merge into one. I pass a car prior to the merge, thinking that car will create a buffer between me and the man chasing me. When I look back into my camera, I see that the man is driving in the shoulder, on the brush to the right side of the on-ramp in order to pass the other car and catch up to me. 
At this point, I was driving close to a hundred miles per hour, scared for my life, so I slow down and dial 911. I explain the situation to the dispatcher, and she recommends that I try to get away to safety. The man caught up to me, though, and begins coming up to the right side of me on the freeway. He repeatedly tries to swerve his car into me, as if to ram me or run me off the road. I slow down in the hopes that he'll pass me up, but he slows down too, and his wife in the passenger seat throws a bottle at my car. For a second, I lose visibility. The car is covered in a brown, foamy liquid. I think to myself, surely this is the extent of his road rage. I look over and it seems as if he's continuing on the freeway. Ready to get away, I pull off onto the next freeway exit, thinking I can now just leave the situation. As I do this, the man sees me and makes a four-lane change onto the exit ramp and tries to ram me once again at the freeway exit. I'm then forced to speed through the city streets, and I finally end up at a red light trapped next to the man. I look over at the man and roll down my window. He's screaming at me. Why the fuck do you honk at me, you bitch? Are you trying to make me look like a bad father in front of my kids? You wanna go? His wife was also yelling at me, saying, Why would you honk at him in front of my kids? I look into the back seat, and I see two children in car seats. Since I'm on speaker with the dispatcher, she hears all of this and tells me to just try to get away. At this point, I was done. I just want to get away from this man. So I make a U-turn to head back onto the freeway. He follows me once again and almost hits a plastic construction lane barrier to do so. He's still trying to hit me from behind. Once I get onto the overpass to get onto the freeway, I glance at him to the side of me and see he's holding something up in my direction. Suddenly, I hear a very loud bang. In that moment, the dispatcher on the phone yells, Did he shoot you? Are you okay? Thinking I've been shot, I start screaming that he's going to kill me. Realizing that running away isn't working, I stop and the man speeds off. Luckily, there's no broken glass and I'm not injured in any way. The dispatcher tells me to pull off to a nearby safe location, so I go to the parking lot of a nearby mall. I tell the dispatcher the make, color, and model of the car, as well as a partial license plate. The whole time I drive there, I was concerned that the man could be following me again, but they sent an officer over immediately to file a police report. In waiting for the officer, I realized that my car's cameras are always recording, so I hit the save button. The officer comes over and I tell him my story, describing everything in detail. I also tell him that I may have footage of the whole thing. We take a walk around my car, and for the most part there's no damage. The officer then informs me that because I'm not injured, and because there's no damage to the car, there isn't really anything that can be done. I ask him if it was an assault. He says because the bottle hit my car and not me that it's not. I ask him if it's reckless driving. He says that here in California, that's only a misdemeanor, and that it requires the presence of a CHP officer to convict. I then ask him if it could be considered an attempted murder, because he was trying to ram me, but he says that this is just plain old road rage and there's not much that can be done. At most, the officer says that once he has a complete license plate, an officer can go out and talk to him, I guess. I ask him if the potential footage could be helpful in getting this man reprimanded in some way, and he only tells me to send me the highlights and necessary screenshots. At the end of all this, I'm extremely shaken up. I eventually went home and reviewed the footage captured by my car. Luckily, I have the entire thing recorded. The moment he almost hits me, his wife throwing the bottle, his face as he's yelling at me in his license plate, even him trying to ram me, it's all recorded. A few days later, the officer called me and confirmed the license plate I had in the video. A week and a half has passed, and there's been no update. While I understand that the law is the law, it's unacceptable to me that this man could be so overtly aggressive on the road, threatening my life and the lives of his children and the lives of everyone else on the road with no sort of punishment. I was genuinely scared for my life, 
and in the process both he and I endangered the others on the road. Ultimately, this has left me feeling very disappointed with the system. An act of violence was committed, and due to technicalities, the other driver gets off. I tried to keep my retelling as factual as possible, but honestly, it was a really terrifying experience. Even in the past few days, I still feel a bit hesitant to be an aggressive driver, and I'm not comfortable honking. I really wish I could say this didn't get to me, but it has. One odd detail is that the man was taking pictures of my car before the bang happened. What could that possibly be for?